Hello, I'm Tim Beal. I'm a professor of religious studies and the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities at Case Western Reserve University. During the fall of 2006, the Baker Nord Center hosted a semester-long seminar on the theme of information. We had a particular interest in issues related to media and power in our so-called information society. The seminar group was remarkably diverse, including artists, lawyers, social and political scientists, systems analysts, and scholars in a variety of fields of the humanities. We were also very honored to host three distinguished visiting fellows, Avital Ronell of New York University, Brent Rodriguez Plate of Texas Christian University, and W.J.T. Mitchell of the University of Chicago. While here at Case, each visiting fellow gave a public lecture and an interview on how their work relates to our theme. We at the Baker Nord Center are very pleased to share their lectures and interviews with you in this special video series on media and power in the information society. I'm Laura Henghold, Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Case Western Reserve University, and I'm interviewing today Avital Ronell, who's Professor of German Comparative Literature and English at New York University, and Jacques Derrida, Chair in Media and Philosophy at the European Graduate School. I guess what I'd like to begin with is by asking you a little bit about, um, about the map of your intellectual biography, the places that have made the most impact on you, and how has the experience of moving around Europe and also from one coast to the other in the United States affected the kinds of topics that you write about? Thank you for, for this provocative question because I've been working, I guess, unconsciously on responding to such a question, but I hadn't formulated it yet, which is to say, the cartographies of thinking have interested me greatly in the last few years. I'm wondering how I'm inscribed by them or in them, and certainly what California might have meant to the effort to think, which is not always encouraged in every area that I've lived in or, or been served eviction notices from on certain levels. But um, it's hard to say, it's hard to say because in my case I feel that rather than, and this doesn't sound therapeutically correct perhaps, but rather than go to a place necessarily because I wanted to embrace it as a site for thinking or, or cogitation of some sort, um, I've always had a resistance to the place in which I found myself. It was always a displacement and a way of thinking it's other or the place precisely where I'm not. Of course, the whole question of place has been part of my work because I've been always interested in the way we lose a sense of place, how place does not take place, or how the originariness of sight is abolished, for example, by technologies, by the telephone, so that it could well be that one finds oneself according to certain empirical markers in a certain place, but is actually evolving and, and cathecting onto Paris. One mm -hmm. could be in Riverside, California, in the most polluted, difficult, asthmatic atmosphere, and one could, in fact, in terms of a so-called headspace, be dwelling in Paris and Freiburg and Schuttling between those places. So if we had time, which we don't, I would try to think also with philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy about the names of places where the gods have flown from and evacuated sites and also our relation to places as a kind of bin or incubator for thought, the way Nietzsche experienced certain places, and he also experienced the Germanic territories as absolutely an anath anathema to, to the possibility of thinking. So 
I would like to think in terms of climate, in terms mm -hmm. of all sorts of also paraconceptual idioms, what it takes to be able to think and to um, write and to work through a headache or a sinus condition because of certain kinds of weather that we had in San Francisco and Berkeley, for example. And when I say we, I guess I'm referring to my multiple and sub-personalities, the kind of thing. So I know that's a non-answer, mm -hmm. but it makes me, it opens up the dossier mm -hmm. of a philosophical questioning. In other words, what constitutes a place, mm -hmm. what constitutes thinking, what is the relationship of thought to place. And one of the questions that I ask in criminal, well, criminally overworked America is what does vacation or a vacation place mean? Hmm. So many people don't vacate or take vacation, but to what extent does that um, press in an urgently negative way the possibility for leisure and thought and random disclosure or discovery? Uh, so one thing that interests me as well are, in, in, of course in French it would work better, the retrait, the retreat, the trace of the withdrawal from a place that is a place of habitual, almost mechanistic commitment. Mm -hmm. So to what extent does one have to book out of a place in order to write a book, for example? Well, I was wondering, do you find that traveling, do you find that traveling helps however however frustrating it may be on certain levels, does it help to get your thoughts going once you're in the in-between space, for example, of the plane or the airport? Um, and do you, do you have that kind of relationship, for instance, with people um, by technology where you're not moving, but you're writing or speaking with them in that interspace of the phone line or the email? Mm -hmm. um, is, is, one, is one of those more helpful to you than the other? Is one of them more of, an, of a home that's not in any of those homes? It's a good question. Of course, nowadays travel is so uh, traumatic and disruptive and unpleasant that I would like a more um, a new kind of transportation system for myself. And I've always considered that uh, telephonic and other cyberspaces allow for a kind of transferential activity mm -hmm. that removes you from the, um, the kind of harassment of immediacy. So it's very, that's a very interesting question because I found myself dictating mm -hmm. to people when they need uh, graduate students who are finishing up their dissertations or need to give a talk or even colleagues who say, how shall I frame this talk? And I do find that something happens per telephone that I can just start um, ah. uh, printing out mm -hmm. yes. a thought in a way that is much more um, blocked when when it's when it's not uh, circuited through a technology. Something about so that might be a little schizoid component component which allows one to open up to the invasive sway of of a technological piece of equipment or or. So at the same time as these technologies are being promulgated as bringing greater and greater immediacy, and they're certainly reducing our time being away from our work insofar as they make you constantly accessible if you're somebody that has to answer to someone. Um, on the other hand, for you, you find that these technologies actually introduce a helpful level of complexity or mediation that allows you to have more to have a different kind of immediacy. That's very, very brilliantly and provocatively put. I would say that to the extent that the technologies have already um, enacted and continue to embody a deconstruction of, of proximity and distance mm -hmm. and produce their own level, even if it's subterranean, their own level of interruption and uh, rerouting, that all sorts of um, ruptures occur that I find liberating, perhaps. Not always, but mm -hmm. for the most part. It, for example, the identity of the other can be, um, even though you think you know whom you're talking to, mm -hmm. 
their um, subjecthood is, is dissolved for the most part. So you get to address yourself even to, um, in, in a Nietzschean sense, you, you may be on a transcendental sprint or something. You don't know where your language or thought is traveling to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gets somehow circuited through a reception desk that is not altogether um, materially pinnable. So yeah, that opens up spaces for me, indeed. Okay. Matrix style, maybe, you know when you refer to deconstruction, the deconstruction of presence, does it change the way you see your writing as a medium when you think about yourself as having a certain degree of imaginative freedom in the mediatized space? Um, do you think of writing as being more like the media than being sort of the second generation on voice in the uh, mm -hmm. sort of the way that the Western tradition has thought of it? Well, the way I've read and thought about and hermeneutically embraced the media has a lot to do with um, what's coiled up inside of every positive media or technology, which is to say I'm, very, I'm always tapping for the phantoms and the ghosts and the spectral um, residencies or the spectral figures that continue to squat in every mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. I try to do that with the telephone. I try to uh, show that with other medias. Um, film, of course, photography. It's, it's not a secret that they're all inhabited by all sorts of populations of ghostly figures and accompaniments and um, even detractors that are running interference. Every media and even what we're doing now mm -hmm. is uh, destined, no doubt, for a necrospective review. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're part of uh, a very laudable team here that is creating um, an archival construct, right, which is to say that it's already promised to uh, survive us to some sort of future that may or may not Star Trek style try to track us down and find out what traces we've left and what we've said. But um, so when I write, I'm also taking dictation and probably channeled or, or um, responsive to certain kinds of um, ghostly imperatives and injunctions. So it's always a question of summoning the masters, the mistresses, the um, great thinkers, uh, friends, mm -hmm. sometimes super egoical prods. So mm -hmm. enemies are invited too, because sometimes I have to write against them and see how I can kick ass or make them throw up, depending what my mood is on that mm -hmm. day. Sometimes there's a lot of um, the resiliency of vengeance that this person is going to really throw up when they read this, mm -hmm. even though they're never going to read it, probably. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a question of whom I'm addressing, what's addressing me, and who's or what's present in a spectral, which is to say non-present way. So I do think that um, in that regard, we, that when one retreats into the solitude of writing, one is in a, um, a kind of space or time zone, you switch time zones where you might be located in the 18th century, the 16th century, you may be um, in a haunted house that, that you're investigating or traveling through. So a lot of things are going on that even though we're so accustomed to our mediatic and medial environment, that are always connected to every media, which is to say the spectral, um, let's say, audience that media implies and requires. This, this seminar that we're working on is about information. And one of the things that I'm thinking as I'm listening to you talk is about a conversation that I had with a friend of mine about, about how people in earlier centuries and decades have thought about how to construct their subjectivity somewhat on the model of a novel. Um, 
the whole process of building is, so, is, is it involves a relation to novels, novels, novels exemplify it. One imagines a reader, one imagines perhaps a biographer. When you're talking about these spectral others and in the, in the, in the, the I, I don't know either the necrophilic or the necrophobic gaze, um, and in, in, in this conversation we were talking, we were we were asking, you know, what um, what people today who don't necessarily, and, and, and perhaps in earlier periods this was even more of an issue because literacy was less, but how do people who primarily think about constructing their subjectivity as a music video or as a TV, um, a TV, you know, 50 minute segment uh, with many cuts for, for advertisements, how does, how does that change the way that people think about subjectivity today in their everyday, everyday lives? Um, that we, we orient ourselves in our sense of who's watching us and who we need to be something for to a visual and, 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 and a mediatized gaze rather than the gaze of the reader. Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, that, that does. Um, do you find yourself moving back and forth between the two? For instance, right now, we are, we are, mm -hmm. we are under a very different kind of gaze than we would be if we were writing, even if we were in the same room writing. So, mm -hmm. well, I've I've devoted a lot of time to considering what technologies and medial uh, manifestations and interventions respond to, but also what kind of reflections they originate as, and and what they are um, calling forth, mm -hmm. so that. Uh, some of my work has tried to show that even though Freud and psychoanalysis are very keen on technological innovation and the telephone, for example, becomes the apparatus that, um, that describes the relation of the analyst to the analysant because one is listening and one is um, uh, speaking or um, all those kinds of things. So Freud was very, very aware of the technological implant, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, for neurotic and especially obsessional neurotic and hysterical symptomatology. Nonetheless, there's a movement, an increasing movement towards a kind of schizophrenic relation to surfaces and, um, and a kind of um, stationary mobility and and screens and opening oneself up to the intrusive gaze of the camera and so on and so forth so that um, it's even part of an obsolescent, let's say, vocabulary of self, in my estimation, to mm -hmm. be very sure that we can lean on notions of subjectivity. Okay, nowadays. so you think that the very notion of subjectivity radically needs to be I think subjectivity is exactly, yeah, okay. as you described, that it's still an effect of a certain literary okay. um, uh, complicity with interiority and tropes of mm -hmm. inwardness and Bildung, as you said, which is to say formation of the self. So I have the sense that um, technology um, undermines and cuts into and requires um, incessant revisions and adjustments of, of, of all of these n metaphysically laden uh, concepts and notions, yeah. And I think that one plays to technology, one, one opens oneself to the technological gaze, one, even if you think of funny films such as those of John Waters where, mm -hmm. where the kids, the teenagers are dancing in front of the TV or a relation to the television that gets um, constituted even in the 50s and the mm -hmm. 60s when television was, became part of the family domestic space and warfare. Um, there's something that, that um, gets inscribed in in a possibly new way. There are mutations that I just look at. I'm not saying that anything gets fully erased because I don't go for the epistemic Foucauldian break, mm -hmm. which is to say that um, there'd be 
a new epoch suddenly, but every, there's a lot of contamination, there's return and repression and rebound and mm -hmm. um, all sorts of um, work that, that goes back and forth and, and also turns against itself. Do you think, um, are there particular video artists whose work you find very hopeful for thinking about this, especially the how one can actively construct a self in a highly mediatized world when you can't rely, at least wholly, on the model of the literary text, the character, the author, these various, these various categories for understanding what it is you're going through. I mean, is there a way in which certain video artists manage to give people the tools for being something other than the passive patient of the technological gaze and becoming more active, um, they, to borrow the Spinozistic language, sort of you know, adequate causes of their own, of their own passions mm -hmm. in a technological world. What I've been, I'd like to answer that, and I'm glad you ask it, but I do want to say that I've been diving under the wave of this great passivity that, mm -hmm. um, that medias, the, medias are, the media is um, strapped with. In other words, I want to go close to the passivity, the okay. most okay. passive passivity, almost in a Levinasian sense, mm -hmm. and look at the wasted bodies that media mm -hmm. creates, and the um, just the sense of waste mm -hmm. and and okay. and um, the trash bodies that I've tried to cr read, so that um, I wouldn't necessarily look for an active or agency-laden um, prop or, or promise. I want to go with the most difficult undertow. Having said that, um, I do find that someone who um, tucks and and rolls, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, with with some of these mutations that we're inferring and, and pointing to, would be someone like Julia Scher, okay, um, who is. Um, she, she was an, a surveillance specialist, a security guard, mm -hmm. um, so she does a lot of SM installations mm -hmm. and video um, situations. And I actually used her work to um, kind of go at my friend Agamben, mm -hmm. who, who writes with a lot of eloquence and, and necessity about uh, the state of surveillance and the surveilling, the way the state um, is always on our case and in our face with um, all sorts of technology. But what Julia Scher does is, is kind of switch the itinerary and the direction of the question and shows our desire to be um, mm -hmm. probed, sectionalized, and invaded by these surveillance technologies. So my question would be is, where is the desire? Okay, okay. And not just where is the desire, but also what is the full range of affects, even the very, exactly. very minimal, almost, almost numb affects. Exactly. From which such selves are built. That, okay. That's very helpful for me because I do think I'm interested in the micro mm -hmm. narratives, the micro and nano practices that are, mm -hmm. and also the kind of syntax of gestures that are barely perceptible. So I'm interested in when I'm reading literature, for example, in, in the splotch on someone's face, what, mm -hmm. how do you read this, what in, in law, in front, where is it that the law can't, uh, in, when you're in court, can't deal with a certain type of paralinguistic behavior, like if mm -hmm. someone's nervously tapping or, or suddenly somatizing or having hysterical tics. Um, th there's no legal um, way of, of capturing that kind of um, uh, fall off or ramp, off ramp of, of uh, linguistic behavior. So in, in a lot of the work that I'm interested in, I'm interested, uh, you're, you're right to point to the, um, the, 
the kind of minoritized traces, so the numb body, the one that can't articulate anymore, is this even a self anymore? Is, is that archaic or obsolesced? And are we not prompted and forced to look for um, a different kind of evolving vocabulary to re-describe what, what's going on? What do we do with, I, I would hazard that, that there is a need for some of that. I don't know that I would call it a death drive, but there is, there's always going to be something that is numb, that is inarticulate, that stammers in every articulate mm -hmm. statement, and that the effort to test constantly and give an articulation to it. On the one hand, I'm very much in favor it since, since in so many cases women have been the ones who are doing the stammering in a situation right. articulated by men. But on the other hand, there is probably there is probably got to be some space for that or the stammering will have to move somewhere else. The symptom will just migrate. Um, how, how, does one, how does one have a respect for the need for that kind of, that kind of zero degree affect in, mm. in a world where things are being tested constantly to produce, to produce some kind of articulation. Yeah, and that's why I, I would um, want to emphasize the importance of, of sticking with and committing to the unintelligible rather than these fast and easy intelligibilities or transparencies or transcendental kind of guaranteed um, even religions and so on. The question about transgression um, has attention to the transgressive dimension from video artists but also from literary critics and philosophers mm -hmm. um, in what I would consider to be a highly consumer driven cultural environment, has it made it more difficult to, 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 to extract philosophical significance from transgression, or are new ruses necessary? Um, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it become old-fashioned? How, how, how do we get the kinds of things that an era of subjectivity in the literary sense got from transgression, how do we get those things again and anew is to continue the experiment even when the, even when the petri dish is altered, so to speak? Yeah, that would uh, take more time than, than we have at our disposal, but transgression may have been transgressed and, and seen its finite limit. It's a relation to the limit, to the, uh, one can transgress a border or a boundary, mm -hmm. and it may well be the case that there's a reason for the mapping that we could probably agree on that now there's a kind of there's been a return to ethics in a mm -hmm. certain way because um, transgression is still within a kind of onto theological horizon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it still presupposes and posits a god a kind something analogous maybe to sinfulness or what are you transgressing? But we may be really post and out transgressed at this point. We may really have to retreat to ask, as Heidegger did in Über die Linie, what is the line mm -hmm. that we, you know, rather than the transgression, what's the line? Let's contemplate the line. Mm -hmm. And so move back because there's been too much transgression of too many uh, things that, that could have been and ought to have been, and we ought to have been the guardians of and custodians of, and there's too much failure in, in um, transgression. Now that might sound a little, that might have the core of unintelligibility that you might like, <laughs> but I would have needed hours to um, actually respond adequately to your question and, and to unfold it in a serious and rigorous way. But it's important to consider with all of the new levels of, of political perjury and lies mm -hmm. and um, ethical embarrassment with which we're faced on a daily basis in the United States, why transgression has been demoted and devalorized and why that's no longer the location of philosophical urgency and despair. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed these lectures and interviews. More importantly, I hope they made you think about our information society in fresh ways. The Baker Nord Center is always looking for innovative ways to support and reinvigorate the humanities. If you're interested in learning more about our center and getting involved, I invite you to visit our website at bakernord.org.